Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Columbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Good to be back on the Three Martini Lunch with you today. Thanks to Chad Benson for filling in for me for the past week. I'd love to say I was on vacation. I kind of was for about a day and a half. If you remember, at the end of June, I was sick, and it turned out to be COVID. So my glorious Midwestern vacation turned to ashes uh, at that diagnosis. And so I watched a lot of Wimbledon, and then finally I felt well enough to uh, go with the family to a little bit of an excursion over the last couple days. But, uh, Jim, thanks for holding down the fort, uh, along with my crack staff here, and uh, good to be with you again. Uh, It was really easygoing, uh, fun something new and shocking every day. And for for uh, for President Biden, if he's listening, uh, Greg referred to his crack staff, not his <laughs> on crack staff, which appears to be who's advising Joe Biden these days. That is an excellent point. So lots to talk about today. Two of them related to Biden and his condition uh, with a nasty Republican platform sandwiched in between. Uh, but let's talk about uh, what we saw on NBC Now. Different Entities on the left have different opinions about what should happen here. Some believe that as long as Biden is weathering this storm and not getting pummeled in swing state polls, and that depends on which polls you're looking at, uh, that, you know, you can probably ride this out, especially once you get a Republican uh, vice presidential nominee in a convention to change the subject a little bit. Others saying, look, we got the Democrats on Capitol Hill, or at least a growing number of them trying to uh, force a change. Apparently there was a meeting this morning and there was no consensus, so... The debate goes on. But over at NBC, they had this guy on, Dr. Tom Pitts, who's a neurologist, uh, says he diagnoses Parkinson's patients all the time. He's a uh, admitted Democrat, so he says this is not in his um, interest uh, to, to point out what he thinks is obvious in terms of President Biden's uh, condition. Uh, but here is what he said in a couple of different clips. First of all, he says the telltale signs are obvious from how the president conducts himself. Oh, yeah. I see him 20 times a day in clinic. I mean, it's ironic because he has just this classic features of neurodegeneration. I mean, word finding difficulties. And that's not, oh, I couldn't find the word. That's from degeneration of the word retrieval area. He's also overcome stuttering, though. Could, could that could that be part of that, too? No, this is not a palatal issue or a speech discrepancy, which is very different from a lemino dysfunction, actual word retrieval, where you pick a similar question or talk around the issue, plus the rigidity, um, monotone voice. Wait, go back to that, the rigidity. What do oh, you mean? Rigidity, loss of arm swing, standing up lordotically. You notice when he turns, it's kind of end block turning. It's not a quick turn. Um, so la- la- that's one of the hallmarks of Parkinsonism is rigidity and bradykinesia, slow movement. And he has that hallmark, especially with the uh, low voice he said was a cold, hypophonia, s- a small monotone voice like this over time is a hallmark of Parkinsonism. I could have diagnosed him from across the mall. And then at the end, he says the way this has been attempted to be covered up by the uh, Biden team is reminiscent of communist regimes. I'm an American before everything. And I look at it and say, when I used to see Russia, Soviet Union, North Korea, when they just make outrageous things, you know, like when when North Korea can't keep the lights on and they say, oh, you know, it was some faulty power thing. I kind of hate that kind of stuff. They had four years. My own party had four years to find, you know, this was a a wreck in slow motion. And they had four years to find out of 350 Americans, one person that could take the place. And here we are the day before school trying to do the homework and replace a guy who's got a neurodegenerative disease. So, Jim, a couple of thoughts here. Anytime it's not the actual person's doctor, it's a little bit uh, squeamish. And after yesterday's tap dance in the press room by Corinne Jean-Pierre, who couldn't answer a simple question and kept uh, deflecting and asking for respect, uh, it seemed like they were trying to hide something. But if we're going to believe Dr. Pitts here, We've got to call the president's doctor a liar because yesterday he uh, issued a letter saying that uh, the president underwent a detailed neurologic exam, which was again reassuring that there were no findings which would be consistent with any cerebellar or other central neurological disorders such as a stroke, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, or ascending lateral sclerosis, nor are there signs of any cervical myelopathy. He does have peripheral neuropathy in both feet, and it seems to be creeping up into his ankles. So, uh, Jim, what do you make of uh, what we heard from this guy on a platform that uh, at least a couple of weeks ago wouldn't have had any interest in it? Yeah. So for anyone who's wondering, why is this the good martini? Are, are Jim and Greg saying it's good that this guy is saying that Biden has Parkinson's? No, no, that's not. What makes it good is that NBC News Now had a guy on 
that I presume was not what they wanted to hear. And you could almost hear it in the, the anchor's voice of, well, this is a stutter, right? Like, you know, this, no one wants to hear that the president could have Parkinson's. This is a remote assessment. This is not an in-person assessment. He's not the president's doctor. But for what we can tell, Pitts does not seem like a quack. And everything he's describing does sound like what we've seen and heard from the president. The stiffness in the movements, the softness of the voice, the, the trouble coming up with words. Uh, again, I, does the president have Parkinson's? We have no concrete evidence of that. Uh, right before the 4th of July weekend, the New York Times had a couple of paragraphs in an article where they said they had inquired with the White House press office uh, about the president's, last time the president had was uh, assessment for Parkinson's and was he taking a particular drug? And the answer was, there's been no assessment since his physical uh, February 28th. And no, he's not taking that drug. But it just seemed like really specific questions. It did not, you know, I, I would not ask you, Greg, have you been, are you taking a particular Parkinson's drug? You know, you seem pretty, pretty on the ball. So it just seems like a weirdly specific, like they, clearly they'd heard something. And we see about this doctor having visited a bunch of times. The White House says this is not related to diagnosing the president. This is for other purposes uh, that he regularly checks in with people who, you know, and like, I, I, I guess Biden's refusal to take, the, the, his insistence that he didn't need to take another neurological exam in his interview with Stephanopoulos was not reassuring. It was the opposite of reassuring. You wonder if there was a hesitation about testing because of the fear of what they could find. Now they say apparently he's, he's had this check. It would be really great if the president's neurologist could come out and take some questions. And you know, Jake Tapper yesterday pointed out when Biden was running in 2020, he said he was gonna be utterly transparent and completely open about his health conditions and his age the entire time. And Jake Tapper came out and said, that has not been the case. We get a letter from the president's doctor summarizing the test results, not the test results themselves, you know, once a year. And I, I think when the president is almost 82, I, I think that's not enough. And I think when you see what we've seen from Biden, that is not enough. Um, so uh, on the one hand, you know, today, July 9th, it feels like the pressure for Biden to step down or the pressure for Biden to not be the nominee seems to be slowing down. But when you've got non-quack, seemingly reliable doctors on cable news saying, yeah, this looks like Parkinson's to me. I, I don't think that's going to make these these doubts and concerns go away. And I don't think the pre this can go away with the president saying, oh, I'm fine. I, I think there's going to be further questions and a need for more information about the president's neurological health. It could be. I mean, my instinct when I first heard the, the discussion of this was I don't remember seeing him have any tremors, which is usually the telltale sign of something like that. But there are very different forms of this. And so... Um, who knows exactly uh, what the case is. Uh, I was mentioning to my intern before we started, Jim, that if you were writing this as a drama and somebody said, oh, the neurologist who we're not allowed to talk about's name is Dr. Kevin Kennard. The writers <laughs> and, the, and the producers would say, no, 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 two on the nose. Nobody's going to fall for that. Re give him a new name. Christopher Buckley, that's a little on the nose, don't you think? Don't you think we should, you know, tweak that a little, you know? Dr. Quack, you know, or something like that. But uh, yeah, Gennard is, is an unfortunate, uh, unfortunate. Although I guess maybe people can say, ah, Pitts, you know, how good is his assessment? You know, <laughs> we, right. we, yeah, you and I should not, you know, say, well, everyone should be assessed based on their surnames. All right. Well, let's talk about staying healthy and getting healthier. And that is with Field of Greens. Look, a lot of times, you know, you're not getting quite as much as you need of different vitamins and minerals. And so you take daily supplements. But sometimes that isn't enough either. And so that's where Field of Greens comes in. It couldn't be easier. It's a smoothie. It's got everything that you need. It, it comes with spinach and ginger, and, and it tastes great. I've had the strawberry lemonade version, and it goes down easy, and there's a bunch of different other flavors as well. Check out Field of Greens. Field of Greens is unlike any fruit or vegetable or green product you've had before. It's not watered down extracts. It is an organic superfood with whole fruits and vegetables. You just take one serving, just one scoop, you mix it with eight ounces of water, milk or non-dairy beverages, if that's what you prefer, fruit juice, club soda, sparkling water, and each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was doctor selected for studied health benefits. It's what your body needs. Don't look back and say, oh, I should have paid attention to nutrition when I was younger. Field of Greens is a key to better health today and when it matters most. To start, Field of Greens will give you 15% off your first order plus free rush shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use the promo code 3ML. That's promo code 3ML to get 15% off and free shipping at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. 
All right, Jim. Gives me no pleasure to make this the bad martini and suggest it's the bad martini, but uh, the Republicans have earned every bit of this uh, with their new platform. Uh, earlier this week on State of the Union, Marco Rubio, who was allegedly in the mix for uh, Trump's running mate, if you'd put money on that eight years ago, you'd probably be in a position to potentially make some money here. But he's on State of the Union with Dana Bash and Dana Bash saying, hey, the, the Republican platform is going to come out in the next couple of days. And it looks like they're going to uh, remove the language that says they want a ban on abortion because prior to the Dobbs decision, the Republican position for cycle after cycle for many, many years, especially since Roe, obviously, that there should be a constitutional amendment to ban abortion. Now, since the Dobbs decision and the court reverted the issue to the states, you can tweak the language a little bit to say that you're working hard to push all these states in, in that direction. And there's certainly some in the pro-life community who still believe there's a federal role to play here. That is um, not exactly what happened here. So here is Bash and Rubio on Sunday. Do you support changing the official party platform to Trump's position that it should be a state issue? Well, I think our platform has to reflect our nominee. And our nominee's position is actually happens to be one grounded in reality. The reality of it is the Supreme Court overturn Roe v. Wade. And what that basically means is that now it's not states, it's voters at individual states who will get to decide how and to what level they want to restrict abortion, if at all. Some states will have restrictions, some states will not. So we're going to change our platform every four years, depending on what the nominee's quirks are. It's not how I remember Ronald Reagan talking about this. There are cynics who say that a party platform is something that no one bothers to read and it doesn't very often amount to much. Whether it is different this time than it has ever been before, I believe the Republican Party has a platform that is a banner of bold, unmistakable colors with no pale pastel shades. And that's what he said when he didn't win the nomination. That's from 1976. So uh, Chris Scalia, if you're not following him on Twitter uh, or X or whatever they call it now, you need to. Yes, he's the son of the late, great uh, Antonin Scalia, but he's just a, a great guy and he's a lot, of, a lot of fun to follow on Twitter. His tweet in looking at this uh, platform, and it's not just about abortion, he says, anyone who's seen a party platform knows that what the GOP released today is, in fact, just an all caps Twitter thread followed by a series of bullet points for a hastily arranged PowerPoint presentation. It's depressingly unserious. Even apart from its weak sauce position on life, there's the head in the sand attitude towards entitlements and the no tax on tips policy. I have not studied that particular issue closely, so I don't necessarily have a strong opinion on that yet. But one of the big pillars here, Jim, is to uh, confront inflation. And other than expanding energy exploration to bring those costs down, which would in turn bring other costs down for transporting goods from, from here to there. Uh, one of their pillars with no specifics is reduce federal spending. Yet they don't want to touch entitlements, like Chris said. Uh, they want to beautify every city in America because uh, the Democrats have let it uh, completely deteriorate. Uh, they do want to abolish the Department of Education, which I'm totally fine with. But then they want to micromanage uh, you know, policies uh, in schools around the country. There's a lot of good stuff on the border, uh, economics, energy, and other stuff. But literally, it reads like a giant series of Trump tweets, like they almost copied and pasted it because it's got all the random capitalization on nouns that don't belong there in normal prose. Uh, and then when when you look at um, the actual verbiage on some of the key issues here, in addition to abortion, you've got uh, the Republican platform now no longer defining marriage as the union of a man and a woman. Instead, they just want to value the sanctity of marriage, the blessings of childhood, the foundational role of families and support working parents. That change was prominently previewed and flies in the face of social conservatives. But Trump has been on the other side of that issue from social conservatives for a long time. But here's the language on abortion. It used to, again, be what I said before. Now it's we proudly stand for families and life. We believe the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States guarantees that no person can be denied life or liberty without due process and that the states are therefore free to pass laws protecting those rights. After 51 years, because of us, that power has been given to the states and to a vote of the people. We will oppose late-term abortion while supporting mothers and policies that advance prenatal care, access to birth control, and IVF treatments. So, Jim, the only thing they're specific on is that they oppose late-term abortion, which I guess means after the first two trimesters. And, hey, if other states want to do something else, I guess we'll let you. Well, first of all, Greg, uh, heading into this segment, in fact, right here in my notes, you know, you can see, I was going to say that most people don't read party platforms and in the end they don't really matter too much because they're not binding and i feel like ronald reagan has literally just risen from the grave to call me out 
at the perfect audio to say, Jim, you are wrong. These things matter. Stop being such a cynic in your old age. Um, with that in mind, party platforms are not binding. Uh, I feel like, uh, actually, before I begin, I'll, I'll begin by saying something nice. This is a better party platform than what the Republicans issued in 2020. Now, that's not saying much because literally they didn't have a platform. They just said, oh, whatever Trump's doing. They, they didn't see any reason to do any updates from their party platform from 2016, uh, which was already pretty darn Trumpy. Um, look, you can overstate it. There's a lot of times where the party platform has something in it that doesn't play well and the media tries to turn it into a huge deal. Uh, but I think it's good for parties to have these sorts of things. I think it's good for party for parties to say, this is who we are. This is what we believe. This is what we want to do. And you don't need to get into every specific detail. That's what the white papers from think tanks are for. But I, I do think that the, you can't just take a bunch of the candidates' tweets, put them together, and say, voila, we have a party platform. And looking at this selection, um, look, based on this platform, it appears that compared to anywhere you want to say four years ago, eight years ago, a generation ago, the Republican Party is less pro-life and much more pro-gay marriage. It is very much less free market, right? We're all nationalist populist now. There's very, you know, we all want industrial policy. We're much less free trade. We're a lot less hawkish, uh, and we're also much less standing by our allies. Um, Greg, did, didn't we used to call those people Democrats? Like the whole... <laughs> Like, and part the interesting thing is you could hear people who would say, um, well, Republicans have to give up on the abortion issue, but this way so they can stay conservative, on, they can win elections and enact conservative policies and other issues. Or uh, the populist crowd saying, we can't be as pro-free market. You can't be, see, you know, tax cuts are the answer to everything. You have to have industrial policy. You have to work with unions. You have to do more. But you do that to say that, or, okay, we can't be forever wars and all that nonsense. We can't stand with allies. We have to demand more from our allies and offer them less. Like we're getting all three at once. So it's kind of, where, what, what part are we saving? Where, where's the conservative stuff? Maybe you could say it on the border. Maybe you could say it on certain policies, but this, um, the Republican party as a whole has outsourced the policymaking part to Trump himself. And I don't think I'm being mean when I say Trump is just not that interested in the details of policy. He's a gut level guy. He wants the quick version. He, he wants to, you know, and unfortunately, changing policy requires thinking about the details and how this stuff is going to work. This is probably this is, this is very much a missed opportunity by the GOP. And I think a reflection of the fact that they're just less interested in it and they're more gut reactions. They're more theatrical and, and, and all that stuff. That's you now owning the libs is not really a governing philosophy. No, it's not. And I think Inez and I talked about this before. I think Republicans were genuinely shocked that they actually won on Dobbs to the point mm -hmm. of, of having Roe reversed. And it's kind of like repealing Obamacare. They actually had a chance to do it. And I don't think they ever really thought they were going to have mm -hmm. a chance to do it. And so they weren't ready for it. Democrats, meanwhile, perhaps with a little bit of leeway from the leaked decision, by later that year, were running abortion referendums, constitutional mm -hmm. amendments in, in a bunch of different states. And they've been doing it ever since. And it's been helping them drag Democratic candidates well. all, all over the finish line as well. And now I'm wondering, and this might be a little cynical, I think some Republicans are actually not happy that Dobbs happened mm, yeah. because they could just hide behind that and say, well, what are you going to do as Supreme Court? Yeah. First of all, Greg, I think you're being a little harsh. Republicans really only had 60 years or so to prepare for the end of Dobbs. <laughs> and that's, that's only two generations. You can't expect it to be on top of everything that fa it really blindsided them. Who could have predicted that six right-leaning strict constructionist judges might overturn Roe versus Wade? You know, it just... It, and they only had the draft come out a couple of months before. Like Republicans didn't know that. So, yeah, um, no, they, they were blindsided. I think there were a lot of Republicans who wished for abortion to be banned or wished for abortion to be illegal or, or uh, for the laws to be much more restrictive, but didn't want to actually do it because I think they either were afraid of the backlash or they were afraid that this was going to cost them seats in elections or in the end, maybe they're like, well, I'm pro-life in theory, but if my daughter is pregnant, maybe I would be maybe I'd be OK with it, which is not really I don't think you're really that pro-life in that circumstance. Maybe you're conflicted. and It's OK to be conflicted. Lots of Americans are conflicted. But if you are conflicted, don't run around saying that you're pro-life. But maybe maybe that's what this this uh, platform is in its heart. No, nah, it's it's so frustrating. The answer apparently to too many people on this committee, which by the way had no subcommittees, which it normally does, and no amendments, no discussion. But according this, to the people, this frustrated. This platform <laughs> creation process had a drive-through lane. That's an example of how <laughs> how fast rushed and basic it was. No, exactly right. And so instead of you know coming up with an actual argument for why you are pro-life uh, outside of the the row context, uh, they just decided to. Uh, 
give away a, a ton of ground there. And then you also had J.D. Vance over the weekend on Meet the Press saying that uh, President Trump and he supported the Supreme Court's decision to keep mifepristone, the uh, abortifacient drug, legal, which is not even true. They rejected the case based on standing. There was no decision on the merits, but it did reveal who actually has an idea of when life begins and when it doesn't. So uh, a lot of a lot of revealing developments over these past couple of years on the right, and it hasn't been pleasant. Well, a lot of conservatives, certainly social conservatives, frustrated with the platform. One thing you don't need to be frustrated about is how you feel the morning after you might have a little too much to drink. That's where Z-Biotics comes in, and it is a game-changing product because if you take this probiotic before you drink, you are going to feel better than you otherwise would the next morning. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. Now, here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in your gut, and it's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next morning. Zbiotics produces an enzyme that breaks this byproduct down. So just remember to make Zbiotics your first drink of the night. Drink responsibly, as always, and you will feel your best the following morning. Yeah, I'm not a big drinker, but uh, we got the sample, and uh, a friend of mine who, you know, had, had been very careful about how much he drank, so he didn't feel lousy the next morning, was noticing that he couldn't quite have as much. So he had the Z-Biotic, uh, and then he felt just like he did when he was younger. So go to zbiotics.com slash 3ML to get 15% off your first order when you use 3ML at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money-back guarantees, so if you're dissatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Visit zbiotics.com slash 3ML and use the code 3ML at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode and our good times. All right, we promised you more Biden on the other side of the Republican platform, and uh, here we go. Uh, so as you mentioned, Jim, it's a, it's a busy week. Uh, there's a, a union meeting, but mainly the, the big deal here in town this week is the NATO summit, which the president is hosting. And so he's going to have a press conference on Thursday. I'm guessing that's connected to the summit, but maybe it's not. I don't know. Maybe it's a whole wide-ranging thing he's going to do on his own. He doesn't do these very often. And so yesterday at the podium, Corinne Jean-Pierre and John Kirby borrowing the same phrase from a Bloomberg reporter, which I don't think was meant as a compliment, Jim. But this is going to be, and listen carefully, a big boy press conference. After that, the president will hold a press conference. I guess a big boy press conference is what we're calling it. Um, And take some questions from y'all. This week... President Biden will speak to national labor leaders of AFL-CIO, host the NATO summit to show the unprecedented strength of our alliance, hold a press conference, a big boy press conference, according to Justin Sink from Bloomberg. Jim, you have sons, but, uh, you know, <laughs> with our with our girls, you know, it's like, oh, you know, what a big girl. You ate all your mashed potatoes or look at you. You used the potty. I mean, uh, this is... Kind of in the same vein as Jill Biden after the debate. Joe, you answered all the questions. So the only time you should be referring to it as a big boy press conference (laughs) is if Biden comes out in a checkered apron and serves cheeseburgers. (laughs) That's a Bob's big boy press conference. Um, I will throw out a theory that I don't think I've ever put out on uh, uh, on this podcast before, Greg. How certain are we that John Kirby is not a deep cover agent for the Republicans? Because if you (laughs) wanted to really undermine Biden, you'd come out and say, well, he's a big, it's a real press conference. He's going to take three questions. He's a big boy. (laughs) Doesn't even get him ahead of time. Well, yes, he's going to get the the questions ahead of time. That's that's that standard for these. Of course. Um, So like. Just, you know, we we can mock this phrasing. It certainly indicates that uh, those around the president have next to no faith in his ability to do this. But look, you know, the the debate was about two weeks ago and he took a week for actually more than because it was the debate debate was a Thursday night. Mm -hmm. Took until the following Friday afternoon for Biden to do a live televised interview. Now, we've covered a lot of campaigns when the president has a bad day or or, or a candidate has a bad day. There's a playbook for how you do it to under, you know, to, to overcome that. And one of them is you put the candidate out there more and you try to cover up the bad image with new good images, right? You have you, the bad answer. Well, you have them do more appearances and you kind of, okay, it's a one-off. Like the Biden and his team keep telling us it's a one-off. And if you really wanted to do that, you'd want the president to be doing lots of unscripted, on camera, ideally evening events. We've not gotten that. 
we've gotten a lot of closed door comments to fundraisers. When I say a lot, I mean like two a day. Uh, reading from a teleprompter. Reading from a teleprompter while talking? Like that's that's a giant flashing neon mm-hmm. sign that he's not trusted to make you know minor meet and greet comments. They, you know, this is about the friendliest audience you're going to get. He doesn't do take questions at that. Um, this is also it was also remember at a, uh, a Democratic fundraiser when he kind of just blur- blurted out that we're on the facing Armageddon uh, because of Russia and Ukraine and the threat of use of nuclear weapons there. And you know this freaked out. But the, 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 the standard protocol for these sorts of things is that there is a print reporter taking notes. Sometimes the White House will take out and put out a transcript a couple hours, you know, anywhere from a couple hours later to a day later. Uh, but it's not on camera. So we don't have video of the president saying this. But anyway, Biden's Armageddon thing came out and they went to the Pentagon. They went to the State Department. Nobody had any idea about why the president said that. There had not been any change in Russia's stance. You know, like that, that, you know, Biden can go off script and go pretty scarily off script on this. Um, we got a call in to Morning Joe in which you could hear him read the papers rustling as he was reading from his statements yesterday. And he's going to do his first press conference at the NATO event more than two weeks after the debate. Like, why does Biden not do press conference? Because he can't. He can't do these things. Why does Biden rarely do sit down interviews like the one with Stephanopoulos? Because he can't. Let's keep in mind also that one was 22 minutes. Like, there, there are a couple of, you know, even if Biden had been in the debate and he had gradually declined over the course of the evening and sounded really bad. I think, I, th- I think that's what people were prepared for. And instead, like the first answer included, if we finally defeat Medicare, right? Like he, he was bad from the opening moments, which is an interesting indicator that like, oh, it's not that he gets tired. It's not that he can't, you know, like, no, he's, this is, this is what we get from Biden. And I mean, to me, Kamala Harris should be taking the oath of office now. Uh, never mind, you know, uh, later on, but like we, we just are surrounded by Edith Wilson's. So we'll see what happens. But the fact that they're talking about like big boy press conference will go is one of those phrases that's going to go down in history as a, you know, so condescending, so ridiculously, you know, uh, a demonstration that in the end, the people around Biden treat him as a child uh, right up there with, you know, Joe, you did so well. You answered all the questions, you know, that we got from Jill Biden after the debate. We, yeah. we have. Yeah. So, hey, happy Tuesday, everybody. Exactly. And keep in mind, when he was a senator, Joe Biden would take at least 22 minutes just to get to his first question when he had uh, Supreme Court nominees or other people out there. This is a guy who is just nonstop word vomit if he was conscious. And now he's, you know, whispering out a phrase or two here and there. So it's a it's a definite, uh, definite shift. But anyway, uh, Jim, good to be back with you. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Please subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast if you don't already and tell your friends about us as well. Thanks also for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us both on X. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Tuesday and join us again on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.